So we should be getting a link any minute here. And then that's the one that will be shareable. Okay. To wherever you would like to share it. <laughs> okay. Okay, awesome. We've made it to the internet, Matthew. Fantastic. Yeah, welcome, welcome to the cyber house. <laughs> it feels more spacious already. <laughs> I know, right? All right, you guys, everybody, mm. welcome, welcome, welcome to tonight's mm. Eat and Greet. So glad to have you. And hopefully in the next hour or so, we're going to give you something that's worth the time you took to show up. So I'm pumped for tonight because yeah. we get to have like a continuation of a com conversation, which is always nice, you know, because it's like we talked about perfections, but then like what now? And you're going to fill in the gaps for us. That's the plan. That's the plan. All right, you guys, I went scouring the planet. So basically Facebook is what I mean. And I got to meet mm -hmm. Matthew. We met who actually is so cool is not only are you going to talk to us about perfections, which comes from that Hellenistic line, but you are a convergence person. I am all about convergence. That is right. Uh, yes. Um, uh, in fact, I will be uh, writing a column in the soon to uh, be uh, appearing Midheaven magazine called Exploring Convergence. And uh, the whole concept of the column is that we uh, are looking for a new style of astrology or a, a new approach to astrology that takes the best from the traditional world and merges it with what is best in the modern world. And we find a way to uh, give those insights to our clients, uh, regardless of the, you know, the approach. And I'm all about trying to find that. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love it. And it's interesting because I've been hearing, I haven't seen it, but I've been hearing about how there's this battle between the traditionals and the modern practitioners. I haven't seen it yet because I feel like everybody's like, oh, I'll use whatever works. But to have a space in the middle where we can all come together and play nice with astrology, I think is a beautiful thing. You know, it's really nice uh, to hear you say that because I think that that's really true. <clears throat> uh, my own personal experience has been that there is a little bit more tension in the field than that. Uh, and that was actually what prompted me to come up with the idea for the column when uh, Mitch, who is editing it, asked me if I wanted to write a column about, he knew that I did both traditional and modern psychological astrology. He asked me which, which I would approach I'd like to write on. And I said, would it, is there space to write a column that merges the two? And he said, oh, that'd be awesome. And when I attended uh, Norwalk this year, I was amazed to discover how many modern astrologers are using whole sign houses, how many um, traditional astrologers are getting into things like uh, Uranian astrology, how, you know, there's, there's this real, um, you know, Chinese menu approach uh, to astrology these days that is, is fantastic. And so I feel like what I am doing is not sort of jumping out over the, you know, the top of the trench and saying, come on, boys, follow me, but rather just, you know, urging on something that uh, whose time has clearly come and trying to become some kind of a, uh, a champion and, uh, mm -hmm. and a supporter of it. So give it a voice, if you will. Yeah. Well, that'll be exciting to see your article when it comes out and kind of see how it continues to spread just out here in general. Absolutely. Good thing. Absolutely. So tonight you're going to take us through the next steps when you're using perfections and why, why, why can't you just know what it is and be done with it? Like, are you missing half of your sandwich if you don't find out more or what? Well, you know, um, that's a very, that's a very good point. And in fact, I, um, I've kind of scripted up uh, a few uh, remarks here with a with a PowerPoint, and one of the the first questions I want to look at is why would you do this? Like why would you why would you take this technique that is really just being recovered significantly in the last twenty years and 
favor it over many of the other traditional techniques or, or not traditional, but the standard techniques, if you will. Um, and I, I just find that ever since I learned this, this technique several years ago, it is my go-to technique. And I always find myself when I'm at, for instance, an astrology conference and someone brings up a case, my mind immediately goes to the perfections. And I'm always amazed at how clear the natal horoscope actually um, displays it. I should probably give just a, like a minute of like, who am I? Cause many people probably have, haven't the slightest idea, you know, who I am. Um, That's okay. I find nice people. So I think there's, a, even without knowing there, there's a little trust. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. So um, I actually started practicing astrology uh, or studying astrology about 40 years ago. Uh, my father was my very first teacher and he started teaching me when I was probably about 12 or 13, but it wasn't until he predicted the attempted assassination on uh, Ronald Reagan about a week before it happened that I sort of went, oh, this actually works. And after that, I decided I definitely have to, have to, um, have to learn this. And interestingly enough, the 40th anniversary of that attempted assassination is uh, in March of next year. And the very first column that I plan to write for Midheaven Magazine is about that prediction and looking at the, uh, the Reagan assassination uh, attempt in, in astrology. So kind of coming full circle. But I grew up mostly studying uh, a blend of different traditions because my father studied with Alfie Lavoie in Connecticut. We live in the Connecticut, who is largely uh, uh, sort of modern uh, approaches to astrology, but, uh, and, and also with Noel Till. But then he also studied with Olivia Barclay and uh, Robert Zoller, uh, and, um, and he studied with Gary Christensen. So, you know, I had Uranian astrology in my house. I had, you know, um, hor traditional horary. We had uh, medieval astrology and Alfie's, you know, modern astrology. So it was a real uh, blend. And I sort of grew up in this, in this kind of an environment. And I, over time, I, I went to graduate school in Seattle and was exposed to a lot of uh, evolutionary astrology, took classes with Jeff Green, uh, became close with the Nalbandian family, worked at Norwalk for several years. Uh, they actually invited me to become a professor of history at Kepler College because I had just finished my PhD at the time that Kepler was opening and they invited me to, to teach there. But I also had a um, I had a postdoc to finish a book I was working on in Washington, DC. So unfortunately I didn't take the opportunity to teach at Kepler and you know, paths, paths diverge and, and my life went in a different direction, but it's, it's always interesting to look back at how wonderful Kepler was for so many people and what an interesting experience that might have been. Eventually about 10 years ago, I got serious about lineage and about, mm -hmm. Um, accreditation and certification. And I decided to take Noel Till's course on uh, his um, uh, master's level course on astrological consultation. <clears throat> and when I finished that course, I took Chris Brennan's course on Hellenistic astrology and Alfie Lavoie's course on, um, on Hori. So anyway, this has all been in the last 10 years an effort to solidify my own approach. And I just tell you this only because the point is that I've always had this, this blend of different uh, approaches in astrology and an effort to reach out and take what's best in each and try to bring them together. Because if they're true, and each time I've studied one or another, I've found that each one of them reflects reality. And so there's only one reality and so they must be consistent with one another. So there must be a unified field theory in there somewhere. And you know, my life has been sort of an effort to get at that. In the whole process of this though, I 
was most impressed with annual perfections. And I'm going to share my screen here. Let's Beautiful. See. That's very exciting. You're like in the astrology vortex of humans over there. <laughs> well before it landed, you know, like you yeah. just were in it. Well, um, you know, working at a place like Norwalk for several years is so exciting because you meet so many different people uh, from so many different traditions and you can't help but be impressed by the diversity in astrology and, and, and learn a whole lot. Um, so, okay, uh, here we are. Now, I, let's see here, let me put this. So I like these pictures because I loved Abbott and Costello as kids, uh, as a kid, and I, always like to point out that when modern encounters with traditional astrology uh, go awry, it often feels like the mummy is returning. Like, oh my God, why is this? Why didn't this thing just stay dead? You know, it died for a reason. Is there any reason that we should be going back to it? Um, and then there are other people who look at traditional astrology like uh, the two fellows on the right here who you know wear, wear the turbans and, and, and the capes and are, and are completely in to become like modern magi. They toss out all of the modern planets and you know, completely um, uh, you know, return to the first century AD and, and Valens or I guess second century and, and just commit themselves to that approach. I don't condemn either one. Uh, I, I will simply say that what I am trying to do is find some convergence of the two. Why use annual perfections? So annual perfections basically allow you to provide accurate annual forecasts from the natal chart alone. And this idea that astrology has always been sold as nothing happens that is not predicted in the natal chart. This is the technique that actually demonstrates that. And it allows you using the natal chart alone to identify issues that will define the year. And it offers, if you blend it in, of course, we have more than the natal chart, so you can use more than the natal chart. And what I've found is that it or offers increased timing precision, often to the day when you're using it with, with transits because of the focus on things like, well, let's put it this way. Um, when you're working with transits, there are about 450 transits in any given year if you're just using the Ptolemaic aspects and, and you're leaving out the moon. Which of those do you focus on as an astrologer? Well, annual perfections gives you a way to know which transits to look at. And because you are now relying on personal planets at a level that you might ordinarily not, because I think most astrologers will typically look for transits of Jupiter or Saturn or Pluto or whatever, and they don't think like, well, maybe that sun square Venus transit is really gonna be a fundamental moment of the year. Well, typically you won't think that unless let's say Venus happens to be the Lord of the year and you're paying attention to the hard aspects to the Lord of the year. And you say to your client, you know, I think this may be a significant day for you. And lo and behold, it turns out to be. So that's, I've never found anything in astrology in 40 years of studying it uh, that has that kind of reliable precision. It's not, it doesn't hit every time, of course, nothing does, but this technique really has kind of astounded me with what you're able to do. Now, what are annual perfections? Chris Brennan did a really good job on your show uh, a few uh, weeks back. I strongly encourage, well, first of all, folks to take his course because his course on Hellenistic astrology is just phenomenal. His book is great. Um, but the interview that he did with you provides a really good introduction to annual perfections. And I'm only going over the key points of how to interpret annual perfections here as a kind of review. 
So if, if folks haven't actually experienced annual perfections and you sort of find what I'm about to get into in the next five or 10 minutes to be a little bit deep, don't worry, just go back and watch Chris's uh, show interview with you and then come back to this again and it will make a whole lot more sense. But that was why I called it sort of next steps. Okay. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. All right. So what does perfect mean? Perfect is just a Latin term that means to progress or to move forward. And the idea is that life's developments are promised in the natal horoscope and that the shifting areas of emphasis, it's kind of like if you can imagine a spotlight being shown down onto a horoscope, but it doesn't shine on the entire horoscope at once. It goes bits at a time and effectively says that depending on the time of your year or the time of your life, different houses and different planets will have extra emphasis. And this emphasis at the basic level follows the perfected or the progressed ascendant through the houses. Now, when I say progressed, I realize that people are gonna think of secondary progressions, most, most folks, and that's not what I mean, this is different. Um, we're perfecting or progressing the ascendant through the houses one house per year. Now, when I say one house, it's also one sign. Let's look at why. <clears throat> Annual Perfections actually uses whole sign houses. Um, I'm indebted to Chris for this excellent chart here. <laughs> we all are. Yes, of course. We all are. If you do perfections, you've got that somewhere yeah. on the wall. You're like, wait, it's just right here. Okay. Exactly. So if you if you notice here, the first year of life is the zero year before your first birthday. That corresponds with your first house. And then when you get, actually, I can make this little pointer thing work. You see that? Mm -hmm. So um, yes, thank you, uh, Google Slides. Um, <laughs> So the first house will be the zero year. The second house corresponds with your first birth, after your first birthday until your second birthday, et cetera. And it goes one house per year using whole sign houses. So it's also one sign per year, uh, birthday to birthday. And the idea is that the planet that rules the house that you are in for that year, let's say it is your 16th year, you are in the fifth house, whatever sign is on the cusp, that ruler, the traditional ruler of that will be the Lord of the year. And once again, it uses traditional rulerships rather than modern, which means we don't use uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto uh, ruling uh, Aquarius, uh, Pisces and Scorpio. Instead, we use uh, Saturn ruling Aquarius and Jupiter ruling Pisces and um, Mars ruling uh, uh, Scorpio. All right, so I kind of blazed through there, but that's the part you'll totally get if you uh, watch Chris. Uh, he does it very um, patiently and very clearly. But he did not do it with that cool pointer. So you have points <laughs> right there for that one. Uh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> so this is the basics for how to interpret annual perfections. The quality of the year. <clears throat> is it a good year, a bad year? Challenging year, a complicated year, etc. Is determined by these or, or is, is suggested by these uh, three things, the planets that are in the house of the perfection, the general planetary significations of the Lord of the year. So if the Lord of the year is Saturn, it might be uh, a year of ambition, but also a year of frustration and challenge and sort of a requirement for patience. If it is a, a sun ruled year, it might be a year of self projection and um, empowerment, that kind of thing, okay? Sign placement also, and the aspect conditions of the Lord of the year. So Mars in Aries behaves differently than Mars in Cancer. And the year will reflect the condition of the planet that rules it as the Lord of the year. And the aspects 
that come into that planet will also affect that. And, and when I say effect, I should make it very clear. I don't actually believe that the planets impose some kind of an effect on us, but unfortunately the language of astrology has sort of given us this notion of, you know, this affects this, this affects that. I see, um, I see astrology as a, a reflection of correlation rather than of, of influence. Yeah, not so you it, are not permitted to have a year of being a jerk because you're in a Mars profession. Absolutely like, That's like right. not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then the, the themes that define the year are the houses ruled or occupied by the Lord of the year. So if you were once again in the fifth house uh, year, you would expect things like children, uh, entertainment, uh, amusements, um, and you know, love given to others, uh, maybe a romantic relationship. These would be the themes that would define your year. And the houses or the house where the Lord of the year is placed is also going to pull those themes in. So if you had, if it was ruling the fifth, but it was placed in the sixth, you might have a love affair with a, um, somebody at work, or you know, one of your children may experience an illness, you know, and this kind of, of blending of, of themes. And then the houses that are uh, ruled by the planets in the house of the perfection. So if it's a fifth house perfection, and let's say the moon happens to be there. Well, the moon is gonna bring in a certain emotional experience uh, for that year. Uh, it, it might bring in health issues. It might also suggest um, issues with your mom uh, or relationship with your mother. And then what houses does, or what house does the moon rule that those issues are also imported in? So it quickly becomes a pretty um, robust description of your year. It's not just simply you're in a fifth house year. What's going on with your kids, right? It it it's a much broader description of what one can expect, both in terms of quality, how good will it be, how bad, how challenging, and these of course are subjective concepts. But we all remember or or can think of years that were extremely hard on us, and we can all think of years that were really good. And, you know, so the idea that this is somehow reductive is just total nonsense. Uh, it just defies, you know, normal human experience. All right, where so are we? Those going? are the rules of engagement. <laughs> those are the rules of engagement. And it, I have a note here to just notice that what you're really doing here is you're delineating the houses of the natal horoscope and how their rulerships and their placements interact. It's not simply that you're predicting the future, right? You're actually describing how this person engages on, let's say we're talking fifth house, what is their uh, experience of things like um, children, creativity, how do they express love to other people? You know, what are the challenges and the supports that they get in their horoscope for that kind of activity? And then all you're saying is that this year, that particular aspect of your life is particularly important. Yeah. And, you know, you go from there. So those are the rules of engagement. <clears throat> right. All I mean, right. I'm going to jump over. I, I will say that Transits and perfections is the greatest strength, in my opinion, of annual perfections, but we're not going to look at that today. Um, maybe we can talk about that another time, but the ability for annual perfections to focus your attention on important transits um, really, to me, is one of the most remarkable things I've ever encountered in astrology. But today, what we're really going to be talking about is the um, description of the year and the issues that that will follow. Okay. So what do we mean by when we say next steps? So those were the rules of engagement, as you said, those are the, the basics. What I'm trying to focus attention on today is three points that take you just like to one step deeper. All right. The first is <clears throat> every Lord of the year, except for the sun and the moon, 
according to traditional rulerships, rules two houses in the horoscope. And one of those will be the house of the perfection. So if you have Aries on the cusp of your fifth house, then Aries is the Lord of the year and the fifth house is the focus. But Aries will also rule wherever Scorpio is located. In this case, Scorpio would be the 12th house. And so you would want to look also at the 12th house as well and incorporate the 12th house significations and themes into your understanding of the year. Then pay attention to the aspects to the Lord of the year. If Mars is the ruler uh, or is the Lord of the year and is opposed by Saturn, it is going to be a very different year than if Mars is the Lord of the year and it is um, conjoined Jupiter, you know, or trying Jupiter mm -hmm. or, you know, sextile the sun or whatever. So this is a nuance here that is really significant. And then finally, and this is, this is really a wonderful thing to focus on. Pay attention to the 12 year cycles of the perfections. Yeah. Every 12 years, you come back to another fifth house perfection. What was, and this is especially useful when you're dealing with adults. I have done teenagers, um, uh, I, I, teenage consultations and you, you got nothing really to look back to in the, in these circumstances. So, you know, there's still a, um, you know, in development, but if you're doing a horoscope for someone who's 50, this person has been through maybe three iterations, four iterations of this house and this Lord of the year. So what happened? What you'll see is that similar themes come up, similar, even similar people come up, the same people. It's just amazing when you see this happen. And if you want to know what the character of this year is going to be like, looking back 12 years will give you a really strong impression. Now, of course, transits can change. This year you might have transiting Jupiter conjoining that Lord of the year, whereas you know, um, a number of years ago, you also had Saturn opposing the Lord of the Year or something by transit. So experiences can vary, but what I have found is that it's astounding to see the similarity of experience at 12 year iterations. Let's look yeah. at a few examples of this. I've definitely found that too. When I look back through mine, I'm like, oh, there we are. Oh, for real. Yeah, and if you're doing this for yourself, oh, Stormy, thank you for bringing that up, actually, because how did I get into this? When I first started learning about this, this is supposed to be eat and greet, so I'm trying to do my <laughs> I know you have beautiful sushi over I, there. I do. I, I brought sushi and I brought my, my, my uh, Japanese green tea, so I'm, I'm ready to go here. Um, so when I first learned this technique, I couldn't believe that it would be true. It just seemed too simple. And I wanted to actually give it a rigorous test. What I did was this, <clears throat> I took 20 years of my life and I thought to myself, what were the one or two issues that happened in those years that mm -hmm. are absolutely defined the year? Like when I think back to, oh, 2008, oh dear God. Um, or if I think like, oh, 1999, yeah, right? So what makes me think that, that you know, what were those issues? I wrote that down in a, in, a, in a journal. And then one by one, I worked through the annual perfections analysis for those years. And I was trying to hold myself to a really skeptical approach. Like this can't work. No, come on. And I, I really held myself to like, don't make excuses or allowances. It either nails it or it doesn't nail it. And most importantly, I wanted to see the actual events that we were talking about. Did they actually correlate with transits to or by the Lord of the year at that time? Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, Stormy, like 85% of the time, it wasn't just 
it wasn't just arguable, it was patently clear. Yeah, and we're our I best was example. so overwhelmed uh, after spending several, yeah, because you know all of the details of your own life. Now, the, the scary part about that is, of course, the way that the mind works, there's confirmation bias, right? Yeah. And we're going, if we really want to believe that something is going to work, um, it will work. You know, we'll find a way to, to shoehorn it in. And that's why you have to be kind of rigorous with this. But I encourage anybody who's trying to learn this technique to try this. Just, you know, <clears throat> pick 10 years of your life and then just apply the approach that I'm going to show you here or the approach that Chris showed in the last interview and, and see if it works. And I think you'll be amazed actually at how clearly this technique just jumps out at you. And, and, um, and it, I think it might become a favorite technique. All right. Not that you're trying to sway us to team perfections, but here we are. Team perfections. <laughs> exactly. I'm just trying to make the astrological world a, a better place to live. Okay. Ooh, okay. So let's look Got at this chart. Examples. I'm a fan. All right. So this person's at age, age 33. Okay. Now, I am not going to make myself look good here. I realize this, um, but I'm going to tell you how I always know what house of perfection you're in. I take your year, your age, and I say, how close to some multiple of 12 is it? <clears throat> age 33 is after 24, right? Mm -hmm. And then, no joke, I count on my fingers. Yes. 24 is, Our best is mathematical because every... Way. Every 12 years, <laughs> yeah, every 12 years, you the first house is at a multiple of 12. Mm -hmm. So 12, house one, 24, house one, 36, house one, 48, house one. You know, I'm not going to embarrass myself by actually trying to go higher than that. Um, 60, house one, huh, got that one. <laughs> um, but so figure out how close you are to a multiple of 12. And then just count on your fingers. Okay. Or, so age 30. So or, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Okay. So we're at the 10th house. Okay. That makes this a 10th house perfection. Or you get the and chart. Get the chart. You, you can see the chart, right? Yeah. No, get the perfection okay. chart from the Chris Brennan has. Oh, oh, oh. And you can just look and go 33, 10 pounds. You, you can, but I mean, I'm telling you, if you learn how to count this on your fingers, it's just going to become real easy and second nature. Okay. So 10th house perfection, Mars is the Lord of the year, right? Because Aries is on the cusp of the 10th house, right? Notice in uh, whole sign houses, the MC floats. So in this case, it's in the ninth house. So don't get confused and think that the MC is where the 10th house begins. No, the 10th house cusp is right here and Aries, zero Aries is the cusp. So Mars is the Lord of the year. All right, so 10th house, that's profession, reputation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is supposed to be an engagement. Okay, so you're supposed to say yes. <laughs> I think I said it very quiet. Yes. I'm so okay. captivated. Yes, it is career profession okay. seen in the world. Yes. And Mars, of course, is initiative, energy, and, and, and sometimes confrontation, right? Well, every here and there, yes. Here, every like here and there. <clears throat> All right. So that's sort of the basics of the 10th house and Mars being the Lord of the year. Now, notice that here, um, Mercury, the sun, and the moon are all in the 10th house. I, this is the sun moon midpoint. I always include that in my charts. But the moon, Mercury, and the, and I'm sorry, the moon, the sun, and Mercury are all in the 10th house. So self assertion, self worth. So let's jump down here. Self assertion is the sun, the sun rules Leo which is on the cusp of the second. So that's self-worth issues. And the second house can also be job issues and issues about the way that you make your living. 
Speaking is, of course, Mercury. Writing, of course, Mercury, right? Um, and Mercury is also the ruler of the third house because Virgo is on the cusp. So speaking, writing, um, it also rules the 12th house. So it pulls in the subconscious, possible loss and confinement, which are loss and confinement are sort of traditional words for the 12th house. And then finally, the moon, emotions, habits, and because it rules the ascendant, mm -hmm. the projection of the personality, okay? All of that is because of the planets that are in the house of the perfection. Okay. Now look, look here also, Mars rules the fifth house because Scorpio is on the cusp of the fifth, which means that children, sexuality, entertainment are also possible issues for the year. And this is because we are looking at Mars as the ruler of the perfected house for the year, but the, also the second house that Mars is also responsible for. And let's say like the other house instead of saying the second, because we're gonna confuse people with the second house. Um, so yeah, it is Mars rules two houses. The 10th is the first and the other is the fifth, right? Um, and then Mars is located in the eighth house, which is mortality issues, joint finances, psychology, and healing. And it could also be like the occult as well, right? And then finally, Mars conjunct Jupiter in the eighth. Mars conjunct Jupiter is kind of making things happen, right? Um, getting recognition for your work. <clears throat> and then um, Jupiter rules the sixth house of health and the ninth house of like religion, philosophy, psychology, foreign ideas, foreign cultures, travel, that kind of thing. All right. So admittedly, this is a relatively complicated thing. The focus of the year should probably be on profession and reputation and some sort of a strong initiative uh, in, uh, in respect to your, um, your year of, uh, of professional growth. There's an assertion of the self, um, uh, an experience of self-worth, and a focus on job issues, which we already got from profession. There is... Uh, um, a lot of speaking, writing, communicating issues, maybe about the subconscious um, or about those in hospital or, or things like that. There, there is a focus on the emotions and on, on one's habits and the projection of personality. And then children uh, is an issue that kind of is an outlier because Mars also rules the fifth house. And then Mars brings in these other themes of like occult, psychology, mortality, um, et cetera, health. All right. So we're beginning to see something kind of gel together. All right. Who was this at age 33? This was James Hillman. Now, you, you probably know that James Hillman was one of the um, most famous uh, Jungian um, psychologists in the last, you know, <clears throat> hundred years. And uh, he studied with Jung in uh, Zurich. And in 1959, he was actually, just as he finished his PhD, he was appointed the director of the um, Jung Institute. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just trying, looking at my notes here. This was literally a month, the month that he turned 33, April 21st, 1959. He became the director of the Jung Institute. His responsibilities were, ready for this? Coordinating and developing research, raising funds, look at this, finance, finances, right? Psychology, raising funds, uh, for the Institute and being the admissions director. Um, his first book was published that year. What was the title of James Hillman's first book? It was called Emotion, a comprehensive phenomenology of theories and their meaning for, 
or ther therapy, um, and it was submitted for publication in 1959. Emotion, once again, this uh, focus with the moon here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one early researcher, uh, I'm sorry, one early reviewer said that the book had a marked occult flavor because he had a real interest in ESP and he was focused on the question of whether ESP worked better if you were in a better emotional place than if you were in a worse emotional place. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of his research at this time in his career, at this early time, was focused on ESP and parapsychology and its relationship with uh, emotions. So now we look back over this again, profession, reputation. The man was you know, named the director of, of one of the most prestigious uh, institutes of psychology in the world. Um, he uh, spent his time speaking and, and writing books. He published his very first book that year and it was about emotions and um, about, you know, obviously psychology, but it was said to be occult and about ESP, et cetera, et cetera. He was clearly making things happen, getting recognition. Oh, and that whole travel foreign cultures thing, all of this was in Zurich. Uh, in Switzerland, right? And wow. he worked there until 1978. Uh, so fascinating, right? Hell of a year, James, hell of a year. But what about, um, what about the fifth house influence? Let's look sure. at that. Actually, no, this is 10th house cycles. Uh, let me, yeah, let me get back to the 10th house cycles. So Mars also rules the fifth house of children and childhood. Well, let's look at what he, you know, his 10th house themes were. First of all, in the, um, at the time of the, when he was age 33, he, um, there's not a whole lot of, of clear connection with, with childhood, but, 12 years earlier, he had written something called The Address to Young Voters uh, and the Cult of the Child. And he basically wrote home to his family a letter that he was hoping was going to be distributed to, uh, to friends and family and whatnot. And he said, you see with us in America is the cult of the child. There's a whole series of writers who have attempted to simplify all language and all life into base, naive emotion and simple motives and actions and everything is romantically easy. Everything is looked at through the eyes of a child. His biographer later wrote that this letter represented a strongly held position that Hillman would work on for the rest of his career. 12 years after age 33 at age, um, let's see, back in, in uh, um, let's see, I guess he would have been 55. He gave a lecture that was published in 1983 that was all about abandoning the child in psychotherapy and the idea of the child archetype and the growth fantasy that is part of psychological life and psychological analysis. And 12 years after that, he published this book, The Soul's Code, and it was it included a whole discussion about childhood fantasies invented by the soul's intrinsic calling and all this kind of thing. Life was determined less by our childhood than the way that we've learned to imagine our childhood. So the whole thing was focused there on, um, on child. So I just, I bring that out just because it's fascinating to see this alternative house come up as a central theme every 12 years in his work. But Let's look at his 10th house cycles. So we already looked at what happened when he was 33. Here's some of the themes that we were talking about. At age 21, he went to study literature at the Sorbonne in Paris. Travel, foreign cultures, speaking, writing. You know, He started writing short stories. Um, he wanted to write the great American novel as, a, as an expatriate in, in Paris and he began um, 
studying philosophy, which would become a central theme of his writings, and visited George Santayana, uh, who was a very famous uh, philosopher and historian of uh, philosophy. And he wrote later on about, uh, years later, about the influence that this visit had on his life. Again, all of this, the world of ideas, travel, foreign cultures, you know, professional growth, um, speaking, writing, all of these issues sort of came together at age 21. At age 45, he was invited to offer a series of very high prestigious lectures at Yale. Um, Jung had been invited to do this lecture series back in 1937 and in 1971, uh, Hillman was invited to do it. So that shows you sort of how prestigious it was. Yeah. This was considered one of the high points of his entire career. And um, the lecture series eventually came out as his uh, most famous book to date at that point called Reinventing Psychology. And so we have, this is a man who's written, I don't know, 15 or 20 books. And the very first book that he ever wrote occurred on a 10th house perfection. The most well-known book that, had, that he had written uh, you know, in his career prior to the latter part of his life uh, came out during a 10th house, or he was, he was uh, putting it together during a 10th house perfection. And then at age 69, he wrote The Soul's Code during a 10th house perfection. And he was featured in the New York Times in a feature article called How the Soul is Sold. Um, he was becoming very famous at that time because Thomas Moore, who had written The Care of the Soul uh, and Reenchantment of Daily Life came out and basically said, I got all my ideas from James Hillman. And so Hillman suddenly became in 1995, 96, this like guru for um, a lot of the sort of new age set. And he became the darling, of course, of astrologers in part because he was an astrologer himself. Brilliant. And I understand that his, the, the birth time that we have, um, he, um, he gave to, um, trying to think of who he gave it to. I think it was Tarnas that he gave oh, the, okay. uh, the birth time. Richard, uh, huh? birth, birth time too. Okay, so that is just kind of a way of looking at how these themes come together in a com you know comparatively um, complex expression of here's a guy whose tenth house cycle is going to be really important. Focus on his professional growth. Focus on speaking, writing. You know. Um, with a whole theme of children, you know, running as a baseline underneath his, his research, but also, you know, occult ESP themes and, and whatnot, um, and done in large part overseas uh, and with a strong philosophical, you know, direction. All right. We are, we are looking now at having about 10 minutes left. So this is a really interesting, um, this is a really interesting case, but if we're only gonna do one more case, I am going to jump forward to an actual client okay. case. Because, um, hang on a quick sec. Did I just stop sharing the screen? <laughs> you did. So we'll just- I, I did that on purpose minute. actually. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to jump ahead so you didn't see who the other the other person was so that we could go back to it if we if we wanted to. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can share the screen again. And Charles in the chat says, hello, Matthew. Charles who? Hello, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I know a couple of Charleses. From the Eat and Greet crew. Oh, they're loyal. They show up every time. It's so nice. That's awesome. Okay. I'm um, just trying to see here if my, okay. Can you see? Yep. Okay. So this is an example of 
a, um, this is actually one of my students, age 49. This person is in a second house perfection this year. All right, age 49, once again, 48 is a multiple of 12, right? So that is first house. So 48, 49, so you're in second house. Saturn is the Lord of the year because Capricorn is on the cusp, all right? And so that suggests issues of ambition, discipline, the need for discipline, possible influence of, of established older men, um, the need for patience and possible difficulties. It also, because it's a second house perfection, we're talking about self-worth issues, making a living, things that you do to make a living and, and money issues, finance issues. Now, Saturn also rules the third house, okay? And the third house is, of course, communication. I have something I wanna say. I have a message I'm trying to get across, but also things that you do in your neighborhood or your, you know, your immediate area, your town or whatnot. Um, it can also have to do with siblings and, and uh, it can has to have to do with travel. And then Saturn is in, in her chart, the sixth house in Taurus. So the sixth house, of course, is job issues. So we have a restatement of the work thing that we were talking about here. Also possible health. And then quotidian responsibility. So just like, how do you spend your day? What are the, you know, what are the day-to-day -day things that you do? And how, how are you structuring your day? That's a sixth house concern. Now, Saturn is co-present, which is a um, traditionalist, a traditional astrological term for in the same sign with, not necessarily conjunct, mm, okay. with Mars, uh, I'm sorry, with Venus and Mercury. So Venus and Mercury in Taurus, of course, is kind of a creative artistic communication, making something practical or material out of your creative vision and trying to make a statement in a, a graceful or creative artistic way. And Saturn, of course, co-present with that is uh, a suggestion that you're, you're doing this in a disciplined sort of methodical, uh, maybe ambitious way. And notice also that Venus rules the 10th house, which is reputation and career. And Mercury rules the seventh house, relationships, marriage issues. So would we be thinking at this point that we're probably dealing with, there's a multiple statements here of, of job or making a living, and that we might be looking at some kind of creative um, uh, communication issue or an artistic thing uh, that is focused in some way on this person's work and that there is a need for discipline or some sort of expression of patience and hard work in making things happen and that you might use your relationships in, in moving those things forward. Huh. Jupiter and Neptune opposed Saturn. Jupiter opposing uh, Saturn is what traditional astrologers call a bonifying factor. Anytime you have Jupiter, even in hard aspect with a planet, or Venus for that matter, in hard aspect with a planet, it makes things better for that planet. It takes the edge off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we might think that because the Lord of the Year is Saturn in a night chart, um, and this is a night chart because you can see the ascendant is here and it comes up here, okay? So the sun is below the ascendant. And so Saturn is what we call the malefic contrary to sect, which makes it the most challenging planet in the horoscope. So you might think, wow, this is gonna be a tough year, you know, especially because you also have Mars squaring by sign Saturn. See, Mars is down here in the third house in Aquarius and Aquarius and Taurus are square by sign. So this is a whole sign aspect. So, you know, Mars square Saturn is like frustration, challenge, hard work, maybe separations, right? Even if it is not in orb 
under traditional astrological Hellenistic terms, this is a, uh, you're still reading it as, as a square. But you have Venus, which is the benefic of the sect. In a night chart, Venus is the, um, is the most favorable and um, most helpful planet, is in the same sign and house with Saturn, and Jupiter is opposed it. So you might think, okay, yes, yes. So this is, you know, these are bonifying factors. They're mitigating factors. You're thinking, oh, this could be a rough year, but well, look at those mitigating factors. Either, either those mitigate and take the edge off and it really isn't quite as challenging as it was, or the frustration, the hard work, the difficulty actually turns out to be really productive. Sure. Right? Okay. So what is this? She's an artist. And she uh, came to me and said, I am applying for my first gallery show in 12 years. I'm wondering whether you think I will get the show. Now, this, is, this has been during one of the most productive times in her life for producing art. For the last year and a half or so, she has been working very uh, consistently to build up her artistic chops, if you will, and posting on Instagram. And she has a big following now of people who are watching her grow as an artist and get back into painting, which she had gotten out of for a bunch of years. And she was applying to this gallery to say, you know, is it possible that um, they, they, they had an opportunity for uh, local artists to, um, and by the way, it's local, right? So neighborhood, um, it's, the, it's in fact the best art gallery in town. And so do we think that she will get the gallery uh, gig, right? Will the frustration and the hard work pay off? Well, the first thing I said was, let's talk about what happened 12 years ago. What happened 12 years ago? Well, here's, here are the second house cycles going back to age 25 and age 37. At age 25, she first applied, she started painting around age 19. She first applied to, to her first gallery uh, when she was 25. And it was a hugely productive period, just like she's going through right now. But she did not get the gig. She was denied. However, a couple of years later, someone saw her art, all the art that she had been producing at that time, and asked her to, to show the art. And in fact, you know, she had a very successful uh, pair of uh, gallery shows that went, went very well. And she sold her art and, um, and she got into working art in art professionally. What happened at age 37? At age 37, someone saw a postcard of one of her um, paintings. I, I love this like postcard, third house, really? Wow, okay. Um, so somebody saw a postcard of her painting and asked her if she would um, do a presentation in the best gallery in town. And she worked like a dog to put this uh, show together and she got enormous prestige out of it and a whole lot of public attention. It wasn't a terrifically profitable show, she said later on, but um, she got a lot of recognition uh, in, in the public for her art. But that was the last public show of her art for 12 years, in part because it had been so much work and it had been so, uh, it, it had not been all that profitable that it prompted her to start thinking like, you know, can I, can I make better use of my time here? But here we are now 12 years later and she decides I'm gonna take up painting again. 
And she has spent the year basically getting her uh, collection of paintings together. And she's got some really great concepts and she took it to this gallery. And what I told her was this, I said, it's possible that you might experience some disappointments in this. You may not get the best gallery in town because that's where she was applying to. Um, interestingly enough, it's not the same gallery as the last time, but there are some of the same people on the board who had asked her to do the show 12 years ago. So she's dealing in effect with the same, some of the same people uh, 12 years later. And she, I, I suggested that although it was possible she might not get that gallery, I said, I think this is gonna turn out to be one of the most productive times of your life uh, um, artistically. I think you're gonna get a huge amount of, of attention, profitability, and that you will get a show. You may just not get that show. Because what I was trying to do was work in this idea of what will it look like to frustrate the situation, but still have it be extremely profitable sure. and, and, and you know, positive. That's exactly what happened. Um, they said that, that um, her, the show that she had been working on was not the best fit this year for the main gallery based on the other things that they were gonna be showing, but they have another smaller, more intimate venue in town. And they asked her if she would show there later in the year. And meanwhile, she has had a number of very high profile art collectors contact her about doing commissions for them. And she has a, an art dealer in another state that wants to make prints of her work, frame them and sell them in his store. Right? So second house, you know, how you make your living. Second house, self-worth, right? Look at me. I'm actually a, uh, a recognized artistic, you know, presence in this town. Um, obviously creative artistic communication. And if you talk to her, she really does have like, like a concept about her art. It's not just making pretty pictures. It's like, she's trying to say something with her art, right? That's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and this whole idea of patient advancement, self-discipline, perseverance in the face of challenge, you know? You're not gonna get everything you want, but keep slugging away and you're just, and you're gonna make progress, right? Just be ambitious, show discipline, and, you know, be flinty. And, you know, you'll do great, just like you did 12 years ago and 12 years before that, right? Yeah. So I love this because it offers you an example of how you can use this with a client. You know, you can discuss if you if you have the kind of relationship where you can get into some detail about well, what happened 12 years ago let's these are the themes i'm looking for what was going on artistically what was going on were you selling your art were you looking for gallery shows oh yeah yeah actually that's the last time i did a show oh really did you get accepted to it you know immediately yeah i was invited to to do it um, wow, that's great. Was it, you know, an unalloyed, you know, wonderful experience? Oh, hell no, it wasn't an unalloyed. It was a huge <laughs> amount of work and it wasn't all that profitable. Uh, and I kind of got out of art actually for, for almost, for more than a decade. And I just started to get back into it. Um, and, you know, here she's back in the second house um, perfection and her art is now again at the center of her life. So it is, it is working out. And how beautiful to be able to look back in the cycles and kind of see even and adjust a little bit, you know, okay, what did I do last time that I was here, you know, exactly, and, and to be and, able to look yeah. back and look around. Exactly. And you know, this is a fantastic, um, this may be letting you into my internal dialogue a little bit more than you want to come in. But um, like, if you commute or something like this, um, this is a phenomenal mental exercise to do. Like just pick a house or a year in your life where something significant happened 
and figure out, just close your eyes on the train and just, you know, imagine your horoscope in your head and start doing the delineation that I was showing you. What are the issues of that house? What are the, what's the nature of the Lord of the year? Is it a benefic or a malefic? Um, are there mitigating factors like Jupiter or Venus, you know, making aspect to a malefic or maybe a malefic Saturn or Mars making an aspect to the Lord of the year that make it cha more challenging. Um, what are the aspects to that? And, and just like craft that year so that you recognize all of those elements coming together and now jump back 12 years and look in your mind for those same issues yeah. and ask yourself, are, you know, are they there? And you can, you can just study this technique in your head because you don't need an ephemeris, you know? Um, you can sit down with a client with nothing but their birth chart and tell them what's probably going on right now in their life. I mean, that's kind of amazing. Kind of, it's like brilliant. It is the yeah. unfolding of astrology because mm -hmm. what it, uh, Stephen Forrest, I think said, you know, you could do psychotherapy or, you know, any kind of therapy or counseling and it's all the same as astrology. Astrology just offers speed. That's our real advantage. And I'm like, you know, heck yeah. Heck yeah. I have um, a niece who is a trained um, psychologist. She's a consulting, uh, a trained consulting psychologist with a, a master's degree in psychology. And um, I did her horoscope for her. Now I do psychological astrology the way Noel Till uh, teaches it. And when we were done, she said, Matthew, I can't believe how fast she said, I've worked on all these <laughs> issues. You didn't, you didn't tell me anything I didn't know because as a graduate student in psychology, of course, you go through all kinds of therapy and you work through all these things. So all the issues she was familiar with, but she said, you got to it in 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> where it takes, you know, months of analysis to get to it. So yeah, astrology is, is awesome for that. And in this case, you're not just getting to the psychological reality of what makes a person up. You're actually getting to the events that occur in a person's life. You know, most of us, even those of us who do psychological astrology, there is a, there's a straw man in traditional astrology about psychological astrology that suggests that psychological astrology is all about what goes on up here. You know, it's all internal, that it's not event focused. This is total nonsense, um, at least from the perspective that those of us who studied with Noel Till experienced it. You know, basically what we learned was developmental astrology. You know, developmental psychology is the, the marriage of nature and nurture, right? So your own intrinsic makeup and then your experiences in life. And those come together to define who you are. And your experiences in your life are really fundamental in shaping you into the person you are. It's not just what you were born with. It's not just the persona that you came into the world with. It is also what happens to that persona at, that shapes who you are. What this is here is a technique for looking at what those experiences are likely to be and how they are likely to be. So it works together with the psychological insights of the Till method to show how the events of our lives contribute alongside our makeup to make us the people that we are. And it's pretty good. And you can do it. You can start doing it right away. If you grab your chart, mm -hmm. kind of start to pick up what you can piece by piece. There's plenty of time to piecemeal this thing together and just think through the most accurate thing you've got, which is your own life and experience. Right. And it, it may seem like a lot of the, the examples that I did here kind of threw a lot at you and it became like word salad. But <laughs> the fact is that if you look at the themes that are here and 
think about what's not here, what you'll recognize is these themes right here describe that student's existence this year to a T mm -hmm. in all of its variations. And there are other things that are going on that I'm not talking about that I know about, but that are personal that are also reflected in these, in these points. You know, it's not simply a case where if you throw enough words on the board, you're going to be able to describe every year. Like this collection of words does not describe, you know, what my life was like at age 49. It doesn't. Um, so try gradually to get into this, starting with the approach that Chris had and, and that he worked through really well. Um, and then add some of this layering that I'm talking about here with the aspects and with the cycles and with the additional houses. And to be fair to Chris, by the way, he mentioned some of these things. He just didn't have time to talk about them when, when you and he were talking. Yeah. Um, but, but if you, if you see you know, how robust this system is, it will just amaze you. And do you remember, a couple of months ago, you and I were talking about your uh, perfections for the year. And, you know, at the time you were just like, you know, kind of like slack jawed. And all I was doing was this approach and, and, you know, not knowing anything about what you were going through. And you were like, yep, that's, that's pretty much bang on. Astrology right? and its speed. <laughs> yeah, present yet again with a good reader, of course, too, right? Good interpretation goes a long way. Right? But it's important to see that like nothing that I did here is brilliant. Nothing is complicated. It's a process. And this is when I'm talking to my students, I really stress this and I, I realize we're running over, so I'll, I'll shut up with this, but um, Astrology in my, from my perspective is about process. And I learned this from Noel Till. Noel is in my opinion, the single greatest astrologer of the modern era for one extremely important re reason. Um, or I should say he was the greatest astrologer for this um, in this respect that he taught a process that he insisted that you adhere to, that you do it exactly this way every single time. And if you did, it became second nature and it worked like hell and it was extremely quick, right? So the way I approach astrology with my students is, look, this is not rocket science. It's a process. You know, take the, take the year of the perfection, Describe it in a couple, uh, what house is it? Describe that house in like two, three keywords. Now take the Lord of the year, describe that in a couple of keywords. Now take the other house, describe that in a couple of keywords. And you just go down the list and pretty soon you have one of these collections of keywords. And now it's your job to synthesize this into something meaningful. Mm -hmm. And what you'll discover is you don't need to because the client will do it for you. Yeah. If, if you simply say, here are the themes and it's probably going to be a challenging time. It's going to require some discipline and patience, but there's a real chance for, for some powerful growth here. You're just going to see the client just start nodding like, yup, 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 yup. Every, every point, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Right. It's just amazing if you just work through this very simple process, how effectively it works. And I know I sound like, um, you know, an evangelist, but I have just found this so useful in my own client work that I, I just can't um, control myself when I'm talking to other astrologers who don't know about it. And I say, please learn this, give it a chance. Yeah. And now tonight you had an entire community of people who have either been practicing for a while, kind of studying, learning a little bit. We all get a sneak peek into the method, right? So yeah. you've done good work tonight. 
Well, thank you. Um, I, I will say that if anybody is interested to um, reach out, uh, please feel free to contact me through my website um, and uh, realworldastrology.com. And I am very happy to answer questions, um, to talk further, to uh, do consultations, et cetera. So I'd be real happy to hear from folks. Awesome. And I'll make sure that all of Matthew's contact information is in the description box down below. So you can click over and check it out. And remember, you can always rewatch this. If you're just showing up a little bit late, it will of course still be up here or the link will be shared. You can watch it all over the place and you can also catch it on Patreon too. So well, however you're going to interact with this video and learn this method, it is completely worth it. Cause once you have the perfection, then put the rest of the pieces in place so you can really see that thing unfold. Oh, and let me um, offer a quick um, advertisement. There is a, an astrology conference that is coming up in March called Empowered Astrology. Oh, yeah? And um, Kathy Rose uh, of the Till School is going to be putting it together. And uh, it was online last year. I think it will be online this year based upon what we, um, or, or maybe partially online. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, Kathy, if you're listening to this, forgive me that I don't actually know the answer to this, but um, if you reach out to Kathy and find out more about it, I will be talking at that, um, at that conference again about uh, annual perfections. And if you are have been hearing me talk about the Till Method and the Till School, uh, you will get a very powerful introduction uh, from some extraordinary astrologers in that school at the conference. So I, I strongly recommend it. Absolutely. So I can make sure that that link is down there as well. And if you have or have not watched Kathy Rose's video, you can check that out. If you have not seen the Chris Brennan video to get the first part of kind of the perfections, you can check that out as well. So lots going on in the astrology community, especially as we hop across into 2021. So if you want to learn or you have questions, people are available. So make sure you check it out. And you and I both, I think we'll be talking at Norwalk this year, right? We will. We yeah. will. We're going to go say more things in public together. <laughs> How about that? Thank you so much for coming over, Matthew. And thank you for, for having me, Stormy. This is really fun. Yeah, kind of crafting a little a little pathway for us. I really appreciate it. I think it's it's a beautiful thing to have an addition to the eat and greets. Well, I'm gonna get back to my sushi now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much for showing up, and hopefully, in this last amount of time we've we've had you, you uh, you got something that was definitely worth the time you took to show up. And we're getting feedback in the chat as I'm closing us out, and people are saying thank you very much. So I think you might be welcome back sometime. Well, you know, when you get around to figuring that out, you let me know. Okay. <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> All right. Good night, you guys. We'll see you next time.